Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Methodist Central Hall, whether you're um, here in person in the building or whether you're watching us online, we're thrilled uh, to have you with us today. I just want to, for those of you that are in the church, just want to welcome you. I know we've got some people that are here for the very first time. So if that's you, uh, you're particularly welcome and we trust and hope that you'll feel at home amongst us. If you're here for the first time and you're wondering what's going on, um, this is just a, like a 10 minute introduction to the service. There are people joining us online for this as well. So when we're welcoming people other than you in the building, that explains why. And if you're watching online and you're thinking the same thing, um, hopefully that explains why I'm welcoming people in person. So really good um, to see you all today. Um, I've got Julie with me today. As um, those of you that have been watching us or being at church in the last few weeks will know, where week by week introducing um, people from our current leadership team. So this is Julie. So first off, Julie, why don't you introduce yourself, let people who may not know you, although most people probably will, who you are, how long you've been involved with this church. Tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's uh, funny to be in this chair, it's a little bit different, but uh, yeah, I've been part of this church. When I worked it out, Johnny, I was a little bit shocked, really. I think it's for 40 years, actually, which I feel, well, I am ancient, but I feel even more ancient now. I read really that 40 years. Although we did escape a couple of times with Nigel's naval career. We were in Rosyth for a couple of years and uh, Fareham near Portsmouth for a couple of years. But other than that, um, yeah, 40 years, we've been uh, privileged to be part of this church family. So uh, I'm being involved in Lots of little things along the way, really. We were only reflecting the other day. We used to do holiday clubs in August, Johnny. Yeah, yeah. Crazy, crazy holiday clubs with loads and loads of children. We used to do like mad things like take 70 children cycling up to Plimbridge Woods, up to, uh, up to Dartmoor. I mean, you wouldn't dream of doing that now, I don't think, but that's the crazy things we used to do and uh, was great fun for, for all of us, actually. So, so yeah, so a long time, Johnny, 40 years, yeah. 40 years. So for those of you trying to work it out, Julie joined this church when she was eight years old. Um, oh, oh, I so love Johnny. There you go. Oh, there you Johnny. Go. <laughs> Always trying to keep in Julie's good books. Um, and holiday clubs, what does that word holiday mean? That's a funny thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. That was a thing you used to do. Um, but hopefully those things are coming back soon. We may even have people here today that are perhaps in Plymouth on holiday. I've seen quite a few people this week who have come to Plymouth for their holidays. Great place um, to come. So Julie, why don't you um, tell us what your role is, who you represent on the church leadership team? Okay, thank you. Um, I am uh, currently the youth and children's team leader. I follow a prestigious um, group that have, that have done this in the past. I feel uh, quite privileged to be doing that currently. So I am involved with the, the predominantly the children's work here. I help to lead um, Messy Church and the Kids Club, Arrows Club, and also the um, junior church work for seven to 11 year olds. So, um, but I, the role of, of uh, team leader is to kind of like keep an eye on all the different, the different works. So, um, but I can't honestly say I do anything particularly with the youth, although uh, we're just telling somebody this morning, if just a few weeks ago, we were down in Cornwall with them um, camping. I'm not sure that so many of them are here today. I think lots and lots of families are away today, Johnny, aren't they? I think the numbers are, um, people are away. But if you're watching it online or watching Catch Up, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you. And can I just remind everybody to share, Johnny? It's my favorite thing to say on when we're, can you click that? little arrow button everybody if you're watching online and share the blessings around the country of our worship this morning johnny's preaching is going to be awesome denise is leading worship we've got a great technical team down there oh they're all in masks like we've got nigel and uh ian and wonderful charlie has learned how to do the technical stuff so charlie we're really thankful that you're doing the online stuff today and uh, denise i'm not sure who's in denise band i think it's ali and sammy is that right yeah yeah. Great. So, yep. sorry, Johnny, I'm talking too much, aren't I? No, you're not. And Joseph's playing as well. Oh, Joseph. Fantastic. Only for a couple of songs, because I think he's I'm, then I'm helping you. I'm borrowing him to help with, uh, with the junior church. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, um, welcome to anyone who's come in since we've started. Great to see you. And there's some people here I know um, who are in church for the 
as I said earlier, for the very first time ever, but there are also some people here today that I've been chatting to who are in church for the first time since lockdown, which was March 2020. So I just want to encourage us all that when we see people, whether they seem familiar to us, for some people it could be their first time back. So um, if that's you, uh, you're particularly welcome. Um, Judy, just back quickly to the youth and children's team. Um, What are the sort of things that we can be rejoicing about at the moment in terms of what's going on in the life of our church? Okay, thank you. Um, Well, now we have the Soft Play Cafe. Often in the summer holidays, we didn't often provide very many things for uh, for children because obviously most of our, our workers are away on holiday. But the soft play is open all the time. So yeah. we're seeing families coming in, particularly sadly when the weather's not been so good. It has been um, busy. We are limiting our numbers for safety um, and to give people a kind of better experience. But we are seeing lots of young families still coming in. So that's to be celebrated. And we've got the, a new kind of slightly changing roles coming up in September so we're excited that Denise is overseeing a little bit more with the family's work so we are really excited to see what God's laid on on our people's hearts really about reaching families and their children and their and their youngsters as well and their teenagers so that's very exciting and uh, we appointed a new youth worker well a new role as the youth worker this week so the youth work's getting ready to take off and if you're 11 to 16 year old woodlands will be happening before you know it so make sure you get your form in because they're going to take them to woodlands which is a great way to kind of um forge the new group as the year sixes move into year seven so they join the the the, uh, the older age group yeah. so they take them away to woodlands and just have a fantastic fun time uh, but it's great teaching too so yeah so that's really exciting and it's just exciting to see people gradually coming back johnny you know the numbers are gradually building week on week so we are really hopeful as as the kind of the numbers begin to drop and more and more people are vaccinated that we feel that we can come back to a new normal, however that's going to look really. But it's great to see faces, as you say, coming back in today. Um, I think there's even a wedding coming up. I think I can see um, potential, I think it's, yes, a wedding coming up. Is that this Saturday coming up, is it? Next week. Next week. So that's really exciting. So, uh, so yeah, lots of really good things happening in the, in the life of the church, Johnny, which is wonderful, isn't it, to be excited about. Yeah, and something to look forward to. Uh, Julie mentioned that we've been, we had just taken our um, teenagers away or 11 to 18 year olds away to Newquay. And there's going to be a video that we're showing next week um, about that. Uh, Morgan is going to speak about that weekend away. Morgan's not here today, so we've put that back to next week. So that's something to look forward to then. Um, finally, Julie, what are the things that as a church, and um, whether you're here or whether you're watching online, I'm sure there's people would like to pray into the youth and children's work at the moment. Any specific things that we can be praying about? Okay, thank you. Um, we would really love you to, um, uh, to pray really for our children from our very youngest for, to our oldest to to enter into a relationship with God, really. We want to be about building relationships. So um, if you can uh, pray for that, or pray for the team, really. Um, We have a wonderful team of volunteers and paid staff, too. Um, We are always keen to encourage others. If you'd like to consider joining us, it is a huge, huge joy to be part of the youth and children's team. So so we encourage people to be thinking and praying about, and then praying for next term, really, Johnny, that all the hopes and dreams that we have will will be able to happen and that COVID is not going to stop us from kind of uh, our mission, really, is to be a healthy church that transforms the city. Yeah, Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So um, please do hear that and please remember the amazing work that people like Julie and uh, the amazing team that we have looking after youth and children. Uh, Please pray for that work. That would be wonderful. Well, we're going to begin our worship um, now. Um, And so just to reiterate reiterate, uh, what Gareth said last week and also in the midweek message, we are encouraging, if you're in the building, we are encouraging you um, to wear your masks, although it is not obligatory. So that's your, your choice. Um, and as we worship, um, we will stand for worship. You can sing now. That is something new. If, you're, um, if you weren't here last week, last week was the, the first Sunday that we were permitted to sing. So I encourage you all 
to stand uh, with me as we sing the goodness of God. Father, that you are a good God. We just want to give you all our glory and honor and praise this morning. We want to lift you high in our lives. We want to give you everything this morning that's been troubling our hearts, all our concerns, all of our worries, all of our stresses, all of our fears. We offer them to you this morning, and we declare that you are good 
You are with us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You never leave us on our own. And we can depend on you. We can trust in you. We can trust in your word and your promises. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Please have a seat. Uh, before our young people uh, leave us today, just got a couple of uh, notices. Um, just to let you know, um, if you're watching this online, you won't need to know about this, but you may know people for whom this is of interest to. We've got a, a, a phone line um, that there's quite a few people now um, can just dial a number and they hear the sermon from Sunday over the phone. It's just uh, like a local call that you do. But if you know anybody who may um, benefit from hearing that, um, uh, please let them know um, and we can make sure that we tell you the number that they ring to do that. And just, um, I've been told to let anybody who may use the phone line, so that's you if you know people who do, if you're watching online you won't, I'm sure. Um, the uh, message from this week won't be updated today, it's normally done on a Sunday afternoon, but instead will be done tomorrow. Um, just another couple of things to let people aware of. If, you're, if you come to the Tuesday afternoon Bible study, you should know this already, but um, it finished for the summer on Tuesday last week. So there's not a Bible study throughout August, and it will begin again in September. And uh, just lastly, if you're in the church building here now and you're wondering when the offering plate may be passed around, we, we're not passing one around at the minute, there is a bucket on a chair by the door that you walk out of. If you've got money that you wanted to give um, to the work of this church, it's not an obligation in any way, but I know each week we get somebody who says, where can I give my money? There is a bucket on the way out um, for you to be able to put money into, and then we'll make sure that finds its way to the church's bank account. If you're watching online and um, you should want to give, then there's uh, many ways that you can give. Contact the church office. Um, if you want to be given details to enable you to do that. Um, in terms of the church office, we are um, endeavouring to have somebody man in the church office from nine until one each weekday. Um, so if you've ever got any questions about anything happening in the life of the church, the time to contact us is between nine and one on a Monday to Friday. There should be somebody there on each of those days. Um, if they're not able to answer the phone, you can leave a message on the answer phone. So I think that is it in terms of the notices for day. I'm just going to pray for our young people that are here, whether you're upstairs. There's quite a few upstairs, Julie, that you're going to have. Um, and uh, there's some downstairs as well. Just pray for our young people and their leaders before they go off into their group. And Father, we thank you uh, for the life and vitality of our church. And we thank you for all that our young people um, offer in that respect. And we pray for them now, Lord, that as they go to their own groups, Lord, that they would know that you're with them. Lord, may they catch a glimpse of your goodness uh, through being in their uh, group today. We pray for those that lead. We thank you for the dedication that they give in preparing and then delivering material for our young people. Would you bless them too? And Lord, as they leave, may they know your spirit go in with them. And may we know him here with us too. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, young people, have a great time. Ask your leaders lots of difficult questions. And have fun. And, um, for those of us that remain, we're going to stand and sing again at light of the world. This morning. Oh, there's actually no words for this one this morning. So if you want to stay seated and just reflect um, as we sing this song, that would be amazing, okay? But feel free to sing if you know the words. <clears throat> Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that 
have made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me king of all days oh so highly exalted glorious in heaven above humbly you came to the earth you created all for love's sake became poor so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my together worthy all together wonderful to me and i'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and i'll never To see my sin upon that cross, oh, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Amen. Thank you. We're going to come to God's uh, word now, and we're going to read today from 2 Samuel chapter 9, and I'm going to read the whole of the chapter. Um, I think the word should come up on the screen. Wonderful. 2 Samuel chapter 9. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? 
Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Your servant, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. And all the members of Zebra's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. And he was crippled in both feet. I wonder how well you know that story. I suspect for some of you, it may be the first time you've heard it. I suspect for others, you may have heard it many times. And um, as you may be aware, um, at uh, Central Hall, we've just finished a series in the morning looking at the letter to the Ephesians. And we're currently got a few weeks in August before we begin a new series in September. So as is usually the case here, um, I've not been given a passage to speak on today. Um, Normally as a preacher in this church, um, we get given uh, what the uh, passage is that we're going to use, but not today. So I've indulged myself, and I hope you forgive me, um, by picking what is probably um, my favorite story in the Bible, the story of Mephibosheth. And you may say, well, Johnny, surely your favorite story in the Bible has to include Jesus. And that would be a fair 
comment to make. But my response um, as we look at this scripture today, and as you, I would urge, go home and consider it further, my response would be that this story displays the gospel message that Jesus is right at the heart of. This story displays that gospel message, I believe, in kind of glorious technicolor. I've spoken on this passage before. I don't know if I've spoken on it here. I really should keep better records of where I speak. Um, But I've looked afresh at this story today. And if I had to give a message, a title for today, the title would be this. um, A dead dog at the king's table. Mephibosheth, partway through that, uh, the, the, the account that we read, asked David the question, why would you consider a dead dog such as me? The context of this story is really important. So I just want to lay that out for us. Now Saul, as you may know, was the first ever king of Israel. And he had a son called Jonathan, it's a great name. Um, David succeeded Saul as king. And he had succeeded them because Saul and Jonathan had both died in battle. And the kind of key verse in understanding the context is verse 3, where King David asked this question, is there anyone left of the household of Saul to whom I can show kindness. And if we understand the historical context that this is set in, that's quite an astonishing thing to ask. The Hebrew word chesed that we translate here as kindness is also translated as mercy. So David is saying, is there anyone left of the previous dynasty of royalty that I can show kindness to? Ziba, who was one of Saul's servants, is called in. He said, there is still one, the son of Jonathan, so the grandson of Saul. He's called Mephibosheth. And he lives in Lo Debar. Lo Debar today would be in what is uh, the country of Jordan. So he was a son of royalty, grandson of the first king of Israel. Why is he in Lo Debar? Why isn't he living in Jerusalem where the palace and the temple? would have been. Imagine today the grandson of a king living in a far off land. Well the tradition of this time was that when a king came into power from a different family to the king that he had succeeded, any remaining family from the previous dynasty would have been killed. That was to ensure no unnecessary rivalry. Sounds brutal, doesn't it? I'm just telling you what the historical context would have been. So Mephibosheth is actually in Lodabar, and he's in hiding, essentially. Because the context of the day would have considered him a dead man running. Mephibosheth is hiding in Lo Debar. The name Mephibosheth means shameful one. Imagine calling your child shameful one. But that's what Mephibosheth means. You can look it up. The place he lives in, Lo Debar, means 
no pasture. So the context, if you look at the heading of the Bible, well, the heading of my Bible here says, this is about David and Mephibosheth. David is the king, and the other key character, Mephibosheth, it's shameful one, live in in the land of no pasture. That's who Mephibosheth is. He's identified because of shame, and he lives in a place of no pasture. In those days, your wealth was governed by the land that you owned. Added to this, Mephibosheth is crippled. Now you can go back a few chapters in Samuel and you can read about a tragic accident when he is dropped by his nurse, leading to him being crippled. And we pick up the life of Mephibosheth, sorry, the first time I've not been able to say it, Mephibosheth, when he is summoned by the king in Jerusalem. So as he approaches the king, he is offered mercy. Imagine the scene. I kind of imagine him being carried by somebody into the presence of the king. And here is Mephibosheth, grandson of a king, dropped by a nurse and is crippled and is in hiding. He has quite a story, doesn't he? Do you know everyone who walks into, let's just say, let's use this as an example, everyone who walks in to the front doors of this church has a story too. And we need, as a church, and I'm speaking to myself here and you can all listen in, we need to hear people's stories before we start pointing our accusing Christian fingers. Everyone has a story. And as with Mephibosheth, people may have been dropped in the past, figuratively, and are crippled in the present. And there he is, shameful one, from the place of no pasture, before the king in his palace. And the king says, don't be afraid. He was expecting death. But King David says, I will show you kindness. I will restore the land that belonged to your family. And you will always eat at my table. Isn't that amazing? The king says to the one who to this point have been defined by shame, I will show you kindness and mercy. I will restore what's been taken and you've got a place at my table for the rest of your life. David defined him as a child of the king. How do you define yourself? Um, I don't know if you, uh, like me, have been um, watching the Olympics. Hands up if you've been watching the Olympics. Okay, good number of you. Did anyone watch, <laughs> um, like at three o'clock this morning, I watched it on replay, the, the BMX, the, yeah, Liz did, okay. I could see you on a BMX, Liz. Um, <laughs> The BMX biking this morning um, was really exciting. Um, and we won gold. 
And, um, but there was something that the commentator said that really struck me, given what I knew I was going to be saying today. Because what had happened is our young lady, I can't remember her name now, um, she had just scored 97 points something. What she had done, she had done something in the BMX stunt ride. And it's a bit like, you know, you could go to the Central Park, the skate park, Andrew would be there and Samuel, whatever. And they go down these things and they fly up in the air. This girl was on a BMX and she flew up in the air and did a 360 degree forward turn on a bike. And it was apparently the first time it had been done in an Olympic competition. So the, the British young lady did what she had to do and then the pressure was on the American, who was the key favorite, hadn't lost um, before to um, the British representative. And so the, as she was at the top, about to head off down a steep slope to do all of her stuff on the BMX, the commentator said this, and I went back to check what he said. He said, and I don't remember the name of the American girl, but he said, the next few minutes will define her. She then went down the slopes. She went up the other side. She turned over a few times. And then as she landed, her foot slipped off the pedal, which meant that she didn't have enough momentum to do the next trick. And she essentially stopped what she was doing because she knew there was no way that she could match the score of the people that had gone before. And the commentator then said, she'll now have to live with being defined by that error. And I wanted to shout at the BBC commentator because there is no hope <laughs> For any of us, if we are defined by our errors. Now I trust and I hope and I pray for this American young lady that she'll quickly get over this, she'll get back on the bike and she'll be great and she'll win the Olympics next time or whatever, unless there's a British girl there as well. But what a ridiculous, I'm, I'm sure he didn't mean it, but if we're defined by the things that we get wrong or we're defined by the things that have happened to us in the past, how do we respond when the king comes to us and says, I'll show you kindness. I'll restore to you that that's been taken away. And you can always eat at my table. Look how Mephibosheth defines himself. He says, why would you notice a dead dog like me? That's what society had said to him. You're just a dead dog. I said at the start of um, this message that the title for this sermon would be Dead Dogs at a King's Table. Probably a better title may be We Are All Mephibosheth. We're all Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth finds himself in the presence of of the king, and he finds that the verdict is already established. He thinks the verdict is death. Instead, he gets a meal ticket for life at the table of the king. And that's the gospel message. We're all deserving of death, of punishment. It says in Romans, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory 
of God. And undeserving as I am, and undeserving as each one of you are, the King invites you. Whatever your story, the King invites you. It says in verse 11, So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. I like to imagine the scene years later at the dinner table. David's at the head. Kind of in walks Solomon with pomp and grandeur. No doubt having just returned from the library where he's filling his head with more wisdom and he takes his seat. And in walks David's eldest son, Amnon. If you know the story of Amnon, you'd probably realize he'd come in, he'd want a seat closest to dad. And then Absalom would come in. He'd cast a suspicious glance at Amnon. They had some issues. Then David's beautiful daughter, Tamar, would enter and take her place. And then Mephibosheth, he staggers in. I kind of imagine like a clunking as he makes his way. And he takes his place at the table. There wouldn't have been special seats for the eldest or anything like that, I'm sure. Mephibosheth, equal status. Would have been a motley crew. They had some issues. But don't most families? Some not worthy probably to eat at the table of the king, but they're there. And we're all invited too. You have a table. The king has a table. You're all invited. And you know what? It's not our place to judge who eats at the table. Our job's to invite. The final verse of the chapter, kind of coming in to close now. The final verse of the chapter says this, Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem. He's not at the place of no pasture anymore. He's left load the bar. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table and he was crippled in both feet. Wouldn't it be a better story, do you think, if it had said that having been with the king, that over time or instantly, he'd be able to walk again. You know, a lot of the stories we read always have a kind of a happy ending. Oh, and, you know, Mephibosheth was welcomed. He got to the king's table. We hear at the start of the story of his condition. And at the end, the writer feels it necessary. Having told us that he lived in Jerusalem and that he always ate at the king's table, that he was still crippled in both feet. I wonder if you find that a bit disappointing. Wish it had a happier ending. I actually find this really reassuring. Because you know what? I have a seat at the king's table. But I still limp around a bit. Following Jesus means that a lot of things I have now that previously I did not have. And I'm so thankful to God for that. But I still have some insecurities. I still can be prone to compare myself to others. I still allow silly little things to disproportionately annoy me. And there are other things that I just don't want to tell you about. And I continue 
spiritually to walk with a limp. But I know that I'm loved by the King who has shown me unexpected, undeserved, and astonishing kindness. And God sent his son, Jesus, into the world so that we could all be invited to the table. And some of you here today in the church or you may be watching online, you just feel so unworthy of this. And I do. And you are unworthy. But Jesus, the son of David, he's referred to, isn't he? Jesus of the line of David has made you worthy. I can't get my head around this, but it's true. That motley crew like us, deserving of punishment and deserving of being banished from the presence of a holy and righteous God, we're invited. There's a place at the table. It's not restricted numbers. You don't have to pre-book. But there's a place at the table. It's true for you and it's true for me. Paul the Apostle wrote to the church in Titus and he said this. He could have been summing up the passage we've read. He says, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. God says to us today, I've prepared a table. Would you come and take your place and eat? And the meal ticket is for life. Amen. We're going to sing um, a great song called Live in Hope. Now, the first long line of this song says, How deep is the chasm that lies between us? This chasm for Mephibosheth and King David, I'm not sure, shameful one and the king, could have been any deeper. But the chasm was taken away by the kindness of the king. And Jesus has done that for us. So let's stand and sing together of our living hope. How deep the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living home Who could imagine so great a mercy 
What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living home. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body Father, we thank you that you are our living hope. We thank you that death has no grip on us because you have your hold on each of our lives. Help us to live this week ahead of us in light of that. Thank you that you've done everything that is necessary for us to be in the safety of your presence. May we walk this week in the victory of that and help us to know whose we are because of what you've done. Bless us as we go, we pray, and may we be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen.